Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the finale discussion for Toni Morrison's Sula, which we read for the month of February in the Smart Brown Girl Book Club. I hope you picked up your Smart Brown Girl syllabus. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to join because I think some people, you know, I maybe I need to do a better job of explaining how the live chat works because it's literally just refresh the Facebook group until I make it in. And I was having a whole conversation with myself because I thought I had started the stream. So I was sitting here talking for like three minutes to myself, like, why isn't it popping up in the group? Um, but we're now live in the group. My hair looks crazy. It's okay. But we're going to have this bit of chat. We're going to have this chitty chat chat about this book because Toni Morrison is an amazing writer. And I'm sure there are a mix of feelings about um, this particular read. And again, just reiterate, please purchase the full list of helps because, you know, I'll be paying good money. I pay everybody to produce everything, the designers, the, the cohort that writes everything. And it helps to um, just create a dialogue around the book to give everyone a different lens and to broaden the access to a diverse range of knowledge bases for everyone. All right. So hi, y'all. So I am going to let me actually pull up this link real quick, because on my end, your question show as Facebook user. Um, unfortunately, Facebook changes the algorithm so daggone often. <laughs> um, and I was trying to get everything set up today. I have five different email accounts. I never remember which is which. Um, there is a link that I can give you guys so that your names can actually populate because you have to give access to the app. But I don't remember which like email account was I in now because it's not showing up anymore. This is crazy. Maybe it's in my smart bomb brother account. Can't be. Oh, it is. Here it goes. In my smart brown girl account. All right, I'm going to post this link in the comments. Um, and if you want your name to populate, you can give them access. There it goes. All right, but let's get into this discussion about Sula. I'm going to redo the intro again just so when I um, update this to, to YouTube, it can be seamless here. Hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Smart Brown Girl Book Club discussion on Sula by Toni Morrison. It is the book that we read for the month of February. And we have the syllabus, which was um, produced by Morgan Holman Bryant, who led the first discussion and she did a really good job and it was designed by Penny Lane Productions. It's so pretty. I love the way everything looks. Um, I put this out just so you guys can get a visual of what you get with the syllabus, but it works marvelously as a PDF. Save the trees. Don't put this thing, these things out. Um, but it's a great guide to, um, you know, if you ever want to read this with your kids, your peoples, your girls, want to go on a little book club on the side, you know, you can always get a little syllabus and go run that. All right. <laughs> okay, the link that I posted, um, if you want your name to populate, because all I see right now is Facebook users, Facebook users saying, hi, Julie, someone bought it a few months ago, and they're glad they have it on deck. Someone got their Eloquent Rage one today. Samantha did a really good job um, on the Eloquent Rage. Whew. It's so long. That's, I think, our longest syllabus to date. It's like 21 pages long, because um, there's so much discussion around the book we're reading for March. But let's get into Sula, because... I've, I've just been loving everyone's comments in the Facebook group. Everyone is having a di different reaction. And please don't feel like the assumption is that just because we love Toni Morrison and she's the icon, a legend, the godmother, that you have to like all her books, that you can't have a negative opinion of the book, that you can't feel that this wasn't a good read. You are more than entitled to have whatever opinion you have of the book because we want to be able to have a discussion that's not based on everyone feeding into a singular narrative, but to have a discussion that inspires all different types of thoughts and dialogues on this book, okay? So, um, yes. Uh, I'm gonna start off with my, I'm just gonna give my little general review on the book and then we can go from there. Um, and I'm gonna use some of the syllabus points to, uh, Go over the different themes and motifs and uh, 
sections of the book. All right. I thought that this book generally was written in a tone that it both was like, wow, what the fuck am I reading? And then also in the end, it was just kind of like, that's it? That's it? Sis, you, you just drug me along for this? Like, this is where we're ending at? It was like, I really would love to, I gotta go back and watch some more interviews with Toni Morrison, but if I if we ever had the opportunity, you know, in the afterlife to sit with Mrs. Morrison and really ask her questions specifically about Sula, where was she at in life? What women <laughs> is this book based on? Because nobody in this book really has um, likable qualities. Uh, it was very, you know, everyone, what do I want to say? Okay, for me, I think in real life, in 2020, I'm in a season of sadness. I feel like a lot of society is in a season of sadness. And reading this book was like season of sadness, even more so. It was, I want to say morbid. It had a very like gray tone over it. And the book overall to me felt very hopeless, which isn't inauthentic to the black experience in America. But you know, the way in which she discusses really negative traumatic experiences as just like plunk, he sunk into the water. Plunk, she was on all fours with her best friend's husband. Plunk, she burned her son. You know, like it was just like, okay, like. What what am I what am I what am I doing with this? All right, but per the syllabus, some of the major themes in the book were good versus evil, um, and how we decide on our own moral or legal code, and wh how we deem a person as good or bad. Because this is much as I don't think there really is any truly likable character in this book. Is there anyone who is truly at the root evil? And I do think this book does push back against, okay, well, what's your moral code, especially when people are living in these circumstances and what surrounds them, what their options are, like, how do we, how, how do we define good and bad here? Um, black motherhood was an undercurring theme. And I think, I don't know if we really had much discussion in, in the book club about the, the, the depiction of motherhood, um, particularly with Eva, and then Nell's mother, Helen, and then even the description of the mothers in the town, because in the end, it's kind of positioned that Sula was the precipice, like the anger that the women had towards Sula motivated them somehow to become better people for a time. And when she passed away, there was that motivation no longer existed, like something so, like this kind of, yes, yeah, something so morbid and negative could fuel this kind of, Twisted positivity. It is interesting. Um, deconstructing binaries and how we categorize social constructs, the good, the bad again, the femininity and the masculinity. Um, because you you do get in Sula, she reads as a very feminine character, but she does somehow, even though Bell Hooks entirely disagrees with the idea that there's any political agency expressed in this book. Um, that Sula does buck the con the conformities, the con the constructs of femininism. Ooh, where are my words at? Of uh, femininity, not feminism. Um, and it does it does make you think about how you view motherhood, how you view single black motherhood, how you define womanhood and women friendships. I don't know if black feminism and womanism was really featured in this book because again, I don't, I personally didn't see a, much of an agency or commitment to a larger community happening to say that somehow this book felt like it broke down the confines in which black women currently live in. I will say that Sula does for me um i love seeing bad black women you know like i love in media and tv not not the love and hip-hop or basketball wives variety but i love seeing i like seeing unlikable 
black women characters because I think a lot of media kind of tries to position us that we have to be likable in order to be um, in order to be desirable. And so Sula not having redeemable qualities and still being desired, um, even in the way that the women interact with her, that I, you know, I appreciate that because I don't need every character that I consume to be someone who I um, like as a person. Definitely fictive kinship and a bond that often resembles a close familial relationship and how those bonds can be absent of blood or legal ties, but, for, but provide mutual support for the parties involved and how we fall into those relationships and how the circumstances around us definitely uh, push us into those scenarios. I think particularly to the households in which Sula and Nell came from, that that was the undercurrent that really built the foundation for their relationship to become as close and sort of intertwined as it was because they were both seeking something that they were not getting from their homes as young black girls. Um, gentrification, it, I, I think this was a question I saw in the group earlier about what was the point of gentrification? Um, and I don't, I don't think that any of the motifs aside from you know the femininity and masculinity and then the kinship one really were like heavy on the nose. I mean, she she called Morrison calls out gentrification by its name in the opening of the book, um, and I think more so that feeds into this narrative of how we define desirability, <laughs> right? Everything about Medallion and the part of town that the black folks live in is painted as morbid and undesirable, including the peoples themselves and even how they interact with each other. And but in the end, it's it becomes desirable as soon as the people leave and realize that the dreams were never gonna manifest there, like really feed into the sort of nihilism about how much they're being lied to and hung on by a string. Um, I'm gonna read what Morgan wrote here. Uh, she wrote gentrification as a secondary theme, that the removal and displacement of generally, generally lower income black communities in favor of wealthier white consumers and civilians. To quote the book, in that place where they tore the nightshed and blackberry patches from their roots to make room for the Medallion City golf course, there was once a neighborhood. It stood in the hills above the valley to have a medallion and spread all the way to the river. It's called the suburbs now. But when black people lived there, it was called the bottom. One road shaded by beaches, oaks, maples, and chestnuts connected it to the valley. The beaches are gone now, as in the trees. And so are the pear trees where children sat and yelled down through the blossoms to passerby. She pretty much quotes the whole passage that discusses gentrification and how after this book ends, the, the town changes because white people now find the bottom to be favorable. I don't know, I personally, and I would love for someone to speak to this, I don't really know that the opening up of the book with gentrification, if it really set a, tone for me, like did knowing that this bottom and all of its hopelessness and morbidness and darkness suddenly became desirable however many years later, did it really stick with me as I was reading the book? For me, no. <laughs> uh, the, the book kind of just trucks along for me at the beginning and setting up Nell and Helene, and Helene who is, I guess, obviously a Creole woman from New Orleans, but it's so interestingly that she eschews so much of the patently black culture that comes from the Creole community in New Orleans to see herself as an uppity uh, black woman in the bottom is so peculiar. Um, I, I mean, I get, I get where Morrison was going, but you know, as you know, when you read a book and, and Morrison does write in a way that evokes a certain amount of emotion, it was kind of like, you know, you want to reach through the pages of the book and be like, Helene, Helen, come on, sis, you could be a little less proud, a little less prideful, and a little bit more like invest the pride in your actual culture versus and setting your value system up above all these other people in the bottom. Like you in the bottom with them hoes and what your husband doing? Not loving you, that's for sure. Um, and then, you know, we juxtapose 
Helen or Helene, because she's an E at the end, to Eva, who Ava, Eva, Eva, because it's E V A, who uh, was pretty feckless, all things considered. Uh, Eva was just. Uh, a character of un um, uh, unto herself. And actually what I enjoyed most about this book though, I would have to say centers around the character of Eva. Eva was a who. Um, <laughs> somebody's called Family Matters. Uh, I, both from the, just her, her commitment to survival and how the trauma in her life kind of inculcated and cal calculated around her heart and but she never gave up on the survival right that you know her love wasn't like a warm fuzzy the way we identify love in 2020 but her love was kind of like you know i let you live and i didn't kill you you know what i mean like i stuck my hand up in the outhouse i stuck my hand up your booty hole and pulled oh my gosh somebody who in the group left a comment about that scene where she took um plum out to the outhouse because he was consecrated as a baby. Now I have a short torso. I actually didn't, that, that scene did not disgust me where she is talking about, you know, what she did for plum as a child, as his mother, and, you know, taking that last bit of oil she had in the house that she would actually use for food and using it to, you know, ease the stool out of <laughs> his intestines because he was so constipated. I would say many mothers have had to do that. Maybe not in that settings, but in the, the 21st century, I definitely have been told stories about my mom as me as a baby having to do get some coconut oil up there because I was born constipated. Is that, is that TMI? I have a really short torso. So I can't eat a lot of uh, fried foods. And my mother has always let me know that I was born constipated. So that scene didn't really creep me out as much. I mean, I guess the direness and the hopelessness of it did, but I was under the assumption that a lot of mothers at some point in time have gotten the coconut oil and, you know, self enema their babies. <laughs> um, you know, the book in night, the, when we're on the third chapter, 1921 and 1922, uh, that was a very interesting time because we're setting up the friendship between Sula and Nell and how they become super close. And I still don't know what we have to do with the scene and the death of Chicken Little. Do we pull out a little liquor for Chicken Little? Because literally, literally, the scene is, they were, and I, I knew as soon as Chicken Little entered the scene that something bad was going to happen. And I thought he was going to fall off the tree and have the wind knocked out of him. You know, I thought he was going to be emaciated somehow through there, like swinging him around. No, this dude has to lose his whole life. Whole life by being, like they were twirling him around and somehow he slipped and plunked into the water and just sunk in to the black water. I don't know how does the immediate aftermath of Chicken Little's death work to dispel the idea of binary good and evil through the reactions of both Sula and Nell. Because for the setup in that scene, it wasn't particularly, I, I had to go back and read it because I was like, wait, who, who flung the little nigga into the, the waters? Then who went to the house of Shadrach? No, it wasn't Shadrach. Okay, Jennifer, I can actually see your name. We can add you. Look, your name pops up. She says she thinks Chicken Little's death was about these friends keeping a secret. I do think the interaction with their death speaks to the constructs of the relationship that Sula and Nell have, right? Because at the end of the book, we do, we do get a, we get Nell who goes back to that scene who um, realizes that in that interaction that Sula like really kind of doesn't have any boundaries, right? Because, you know, what was the purpose of her cutting off the top of her forefinger as the warning to the gang of white Catholic boys? And it's because she doesn't even like, she only knows how to exist, what was the ending said? That she only knows how to exist 
in like this state of fear. <laughs> you do keep posting your name, Jennifer. <laughs> um, oh, I want to pull the quote from the end of the book. Let me see if we're going to actually put it here in the syllabus. Yeah, at the end of the book, when Nell is reflecting on her relationship with Sula and just kind of going through this idea that, you know, Sula did things is because she just, she never, she didn't have a limit and she just kept careening and like her doing these things, you you would think in, in the moment, originally Nell thought that this was endearing, that Sula was so set on protecting Nell. But what it really is that Nell, Sula never had any grounding. She never had anything to stand for. And so she just kept going out of her own excitement. And she kept, she keeps doing things out of her own. And it's kind of like, I would define it as like self-masturbatory, right? Like this is how she sues herself <laughs> by doing these wild, exciting actions, but that she doesn't really put any thought behind them. She never questions the why or the how. Um, and she never has those self-reflective moments with herself until she uh, catches that one man whose name she don't even know. Baby. She doesn't, um, what are the questions? Ooh, am I frozen on here? Um, let me post this link again. Um, I didn't, I don't know what the literary purposes were in Morrison presenting events out of chronological order, right? So at the beginning of the book, we get the, we get the, we get the setup to, to suicide day, which doesn't really reappear. You know, a lot of the things that are set up at the very, very beginning of the book don't really come into fruition or matter until like literally the last chapter of the book. Um, whether it's Shadrach, am I saying, you know, you know, I don't never remember no names, baby. <laughs> I probably should have wrote in, written a note of who all the characters were at the beginning because I'm just going to run all the men together. Um, Yeah, it is Shadrach. Okay, I'm right. All right, so Shadrach and Suicide Day. We really don't even get between the Suicide Day and then the aftermath of Chicken Little's death. We don't even get what is really going on with Shadrach until the end of the book. And then it turns out Shadrach might have the most sense out of all these niggas. I don't, I don't know what Morrison was reaching for when she decided to set up Shadrach's national suicide at the beginning and then not bring it back up until the very end of the book. But I guess on some levels, did it did it punch harder? Did it hit harder? Like, damn, because he been waiting this whole book because he knew it was something. And then again, it is something, and it's something that's really traumatic and overwhelming, but that is permitted, that's presented, ooh, permitted, that is presented in such a, again, the whole book, matter of fact way. Them niggas died in a cave. Oh, okay. Okay, niggas gonna die in a cave. Okay, well, that's what it is today. That's what it is today. What did you guys assess of Sula's relationship with her mother, Hannah? Because complex mother-daughter relationships are thematic in black families. So what, especially if we give um, specific attention to the way that Hannah died and then Eva's presumption of Sula as she watched her mother burn, What was, was there anything unique? Was there anything to take from that relationship between Sula and 
Hannah. And then also to think about how Sula goes on to engage with men, similar to the way her mother does, but not but very different from the way her mother does it. Because on some levels, you do get the sense that there was some sort of fulfillment, that Hannah was okay with her plot in life, that Hannah wasn't doing, wasn't desiring anything more from the men she engaged with. And Sula is presented as just so hopeless that it's not that she doesn't actually desire anything more from the men, it's that she just ain't think about it until she had to think about it. And then it's like, oh, I got caught up. And um, aside from Sula and Hannah, what do we make of Eva and Plum? So somebody posted yesterday that they took that scene where Eva is discussing why she burned Plum as Plum was raping Eva. Now, I did not read that scene the same way. Um, I thought it was allegorical the way she was describing Plum trying to crawl back into her womb. I didn't read it as a, like a phallic crawling of into the womb. There were penises involved. Um, I thought that it was just like she was talking more about him as a drug addict, him as some, the way he was living and like the nastiness and the way he was, he came back not a man and he was basically, she was watching her son decompose. Yes, Tanisha, I do think this is true going back to the point about Sula and Hannah, that there was an obvious change in Sula when she overheard Hannah talking about the fact that she doesn't really love her own child, that she, you know, and I, it's not uncommon, right, especially during your teen years to have mothers who like, you know, I love my child, but I don't like my child, but Hannah was straight up like, you know, she mind, but uh, some some may write about it. Yes, I too read the setup between Plum and Eva and her reason for killing him as him becoming a man child. He was literally decomposing before her. And as Jennifer points out, thank you for copy and pasting your name again. But infantile men throughout the narrative. They're, you know, all of them, I mean, is, is, is that not a commentary on patriarchy? I guess if we're gonna talk about the image, you can't talk about the image of black motherhood and the dynamic between black women without discussing the, the role that patriarchy has in, in impacting those relationships. Um, and the men do seem to all like the women are all surviving by looking out for their children and protecting and keeping some sort of household together. And the men are being taken care of. <laughs> you know, the niggas are being niggas. <laughs> it ain't much change. And, uh, you know, here we, <laughs> we do, we get a series of infantile, emotionally immature, Men, because there will always be a woman to take care of them. But for women, there's not always a woman. To, there's no one else to take care of the women. There's no one else to take care of the children. Um. Yeah. Oh. They are the bomb for men's egos. Yes. Um. And again, I didn't take it as rape either. I took it as him becoming a child again by moving back in and perhaps expecting Eva to take care of him. And I don't even know if maybe consciously he expected Eva to take care of him, but he was literally just doing this, or he was taking it to the extreme of what every other man in the bottom was doing, which on some level, I don't think any, and this actually fits into the, the era in which this book was written, right? You, the point that when Morrison was writing this book and you have like the color purple or uh, the Temple of My Familiar by Alice Walker uh, or Gloria Naylor and, Beast and Bill, if, if, I wanna say Bill, <laughs> wrong book, if, <laughs> Bill Street Guitar. No, The Women of Booster Place and Mama's Day, right? You get these books where like, all these books are discussing kind of 
really major things around black womanhood and motherhood. And then all the men in the book, just like the men just can't, the men don't, they fish out of water. Um, men do not know how to survive on their own. It's a constant theme in this area of books that men constantly rely in a community that's struggling and does and really is pretty hopeless that the men still find a way to rely so heavily on the women. And the women can do have no other option but to rely on themselves. Uh, this book was written, this is her second book. So I would actually say it was written in, let's see. Nineteen seventy-three. Yes, we're in the seventies. It was. Um, I would love to hear if anyone has negative opinions of the book. What didn't you care for? What didn't you like about this book? I want to keep talking about these themes, but if there's something that maybe you want to skip ahead to or discuss pertinently about this read, please feel free to comment and we'll, we'll touch on it. Uh, Do you think that there were really any, what were the unforgivable offenses that Sula committed um, that caused her to become the pariah of the bottom? And how do you view these transgressions? Yes, as Coco says, when Hannah asked Eva, did she love her? And Eva basically said, I took care of you. So obviously that means I love you. That is very often said in black families. And I mean, yeah, I think that is, it's it's the indictment towards the, you know, black women not being able to disengage the way that black men disengage. And some force in society constantly forcing their hand and moving them towards, you know, at the very least supporting their children. Um, and not to say that no one ever, you know, a bit, no black woman ever abandoned, abandoned their children because even the, he, yes, that does happen. But in Sula in particular, there's a one black mother in town who kind of has abandoned her child, but the, the return of Sula and Sula taking up with all the men, you know, suddenly motivates her to be a mother because she has something to prove against Sula. And that the way that these black women can kind of show their acceptableness or their worthiness or their respectability is, you know, without any other option is they're taking care of their house and home. You think that the, I, I think personally for a lot of us, yes, Andrea, that Sula sleeping with Nell's husband was an unforgivable act. I don't actually think that's the unforgivable act that put her at the pariah of the bottom, that put her as the, put us, you know, the scarlet letter on her chest where nobody was fucking with her. I don't think people actually cared about her interactions with Nell's husband. Um, I think... Um, I'm reading y'all comments and then love my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, but I think there was a there's a part in the book where Tony is discussing how Sula interacts with the men. And it was sort of her carelessness in their interaction where suddenly the men are now turning on her, which really kind of made it where she was like the image of disgust because, you know, what, what was she doing that was different from Hannah, right? Hannah was kind of, you know, having this, this sensual moment where she reaped some joy and benefit from it and then let the men go with like this joy on their, you know, their hearts. But for the way Sula just interacts without interact without thought, and she's just kind of feeding into this carnal sensation, and then discarding it, it for whatever reason. Someone who maybe has more grace and explaining this can chime in. Um, definitely motivates both the men and women and children <laughs> to turn their nose up at Sula, and that's that's kind of an interesting dichotomy that she could do all these other things. And really, it's not even that she's sleeping with the men. No, and then it's the assumption that she's sleeping with white men, right? That that really does it in for them. 
it's crazy. It's it's crazy, right? The way that we feed into the value of white people that suddenly her, her not not that she was taking up white people's husbands, not with the niggas, but that she was sleeping with a white man could make her so negatively looked upon in the community. Uh, who said this? Because I can't see your name. Uh, at the end of the book, when Shadrach was having his reflection, it made me think he could possibly been Sula's dad. Anyone else feel that, or am I tripping? I definitely, I think I was so, I, I, I was so stuck on Tony, you just gonna leave with us and you just gonna, just matter of fact tone, is, this is it? That I didn't even really think about, I didn't really walk away from this book with a lot of conspiracy theories because I was so busy <laughs> just getting over the way Tony wrote the book in the first place. But let me know if anyone else thought that Chirac could have possibly been Sula's father. I agree. It was sometimes hard to envision what was happening in the book. And you had to reread what was happening once or twice because like, what the fuck? Did Tony really just write that and keep it moving? Christina, asked, I think a lot of us were having that interaction. And it kind of, it makes the book fun, but it also makes the book difficult at times because you feel like you're missing things. You feel like there are, deeper themes and deeper connections you should be making, but it's just so like, duh, 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 duh. Hey, you left, could I have gotten a little bit more? Like, could I, could, like, did I miss it? Did I miss something? Oh, boy, boy, waltzing into Eva's home, sipping lemonade while his new bae waited outside. And Sula was, was it Sula or was it Eva was chill? I think that really kind of crystallized the hate in, it, I don't want to say the hate, but it, you know, the calcium around Eva's heart with regards to how she loved her children. I think that, you know, did she she never really broke it down until like years later when she was like, with, you know, Plum coming back into the house where she was like, oh yeah, I really did hate this thing. Like I hate it. I absolutely do agree that Sula was a lot of things. I don't know if she was everything, but she was a lot of things that they couldn't stand a woman to be. And it's interesting though, because the character Sula again is such a thoughtless character. She's not a person that has like true agency or politics or you know, this deep thought, even though she goes to college and gets educated and she learns all these big words, she's just so mindless that she doesn't necessarily consciously buck the system of what it means to be a woman and a feminine woman, but she's just so careless. And it's, you know, it is set up that black women don't really have the opportunity to be careless. You know, that carefree black girl mantra, you gotta have a bank account for it. Jordana Henry says, either way, both Hannah and Sula were doomed. Black women ain't getting no love. I think I think all the characters in the bottom were in some way doomed, but it was more or less, how do you survive with nothing? Rachel says, I thought Sula might be a sociopath. She had no emotions, rarely any regret. Who cuts off their own finger, watch two people die, sleep with their friend's husband, etc." Huh. And she continues, and then her mother and grandmother had some of the same tendencies. You burned your son and wobbled the stairs like you had just fried a chicken. I mean, was Tony really giving us a commentary on mental health? And the fact that you could like, I, I, I you know, is that my own bias that I read this whole book and not once except for Shadrach and you know, the PTSD that these men clearly came back with from the war, maybe a little touch of autism. Did I think that like any of the black women characters were dealing with, I mean, I guess you can, you're so, you know, so being a sociopath, can schizophrenia, can, I don't know. I don't want to like misspeak about mental health and like stigmatize it any further, but I don't know, can it be triggered by things? Because that was my assumption in reading the book that because the, um, the women have specific circumstances that led to them absorbing the trauma and reacting a certain way, 
that I didn't even consider that, oh, they might be a sociopath or, I mean, obviously a narcissist, but I didn't really think too deeply about the mental health implications as far as like, what would the diagnosis be um, for the character? And maybe I also made the assumption that it kind of goes without saying that, you know, this whole town has anxiety and depression, the whole town, the whole town, like how could you not? Body mutilation as a means to provide and protect for Eva and Sula. You know, I think what Eva did had a thought behind it, right? Cutting off her leg, whether it was, you know, to get the money, a little bit of insurance money, you know, um, or to get people to stop harassing her, or uh, whatever it was. Because you have to also think about the time period. Like, outside of the church, Black women didn't really have a lot of options in this period of safe places to go. And being a Black woman who worked and who was on essentially on the streets, you know, whether whatever you were doing, walking down the street as a black woman, made you susceptible to like an, a really audacious level of harassment. And so I think Eva had a very particular train of, you know, thought out process to why she cut her leg off. Sula with the fingertip was just thoughtless. It was mindless. It, there was nothing really proceeding and connecting that to some deeper political motivation. I don't believe. Another thing that made Sula so a pariah was that she seemed so aloof. And at times there seemed to be an evilness about her as well as a sort of disassociation. Like she was there, but she wasn't. Occasionally it seemed like she was watching her own life from the outside and couldn't grapple with it or understand why she acted the way she did. And I, that, definitely, that definitely comes up at the end of the book, right? Where we are going back over through Nell's narrative who and what Sula really was and what that attachment was. Um, and yeah, it is this realization that Nell never, Sula, I can watch it in, in, in 50 nights, right? That Sula doesn't really have anything that she's attached to. Not a thought, not a care, um, except for the one man who she kind of liked for a very brief period of time. What was that man's name who she put on her nice lingerie for? He was like, ooh. <laughs> then she realized she didn't even know a nigga name. You know? She ain't even realized that she, she didn't realize. She didn't even know. Ajax. And what was his name in the end? Alex something. Yeah, the book was, I don't think the message was, I do think a part of the message was this kind of hopelessness and how maybe we don't win when the community is so set up around valuing themselves over each other, right? Like the part of the sadness and morbidness of the book comes from even the way that they all like turn inwards and turn their nose about each other. And therefore nobody can win because there was no sense of kinship, or no sense of real kinship or community that had a thought behind it. Uh, you know, when Sula put on her little bit of nice lingerie for Ajax, and he he realized that very familiar feeling of a woman wanting him, owning him, and he dipped on out. Then the next scene, three of his brothers die in the cave. Okay, what do we make of the ending scene? Like, what do you do with the last national suicide day where these people got so electrified? so motivated in realizing that like <laughs> you know that they've been lied to for so long that they walked on down to that dang railroad track 
and then marched on into the cave and Shadrach still back stunned and was like, I ain't going in here and I would have been that nigga. That would have been me. And then you have this, uh, yeah, an unintentional mass suicide from the, the cave falling into itself. Again, it's just written so kind of like, and they marched on down, and, you know, there, it was almost like the gloom was lifted from Sula's passing, but it didn't actually come with any goodness coming into their lives. Hmm. Yes, it was situational irony. They did not control their own deaths. I do think what Sula does over and over again throughout the book is that it, it does make us consider, are we destined um, to endure certain circumstances and outcomes based on our experiences both as black people and as black women. So when we meet at the intersection of race and gender, are we subscribed to a predestined set of experiences and can we ever climb out of those? I mean, you know, Sula somehow responds so much to the trauma that surrounded her childhood by like, in essence, kind of, everyone kind of loses their mind in a different way. Um, and even though Sula got out and went to college and had all these world experiences, never found that sort of fulfillment that she was searching for in the least bit. She could never grasp on anything tangible. Um, and ends up coming back and like dying a very pitiful death. It was so sad. Uh, what I do think the presentation of this book does make you think about how you define a good and a bad character. Because things are written so matter-of-factly, and I think, you know, maybe what Tony is doing is that she's kind of suggesting that things do happen and, and no one stops. No one, you know, life keeps going on, right? And because people don't have options, because people don't have access, they don't have means or equity in the bottom, that the only thing they can do is keep going. And you literally just gotta keep careening through all these traumatic things that are happening. And so because of that, no one really presents as a good person in the traditional sense that we understand. And everyone kind of dabbles in things that we would believe to be, make them inherently evil, but everyone was just surviving in the way that they knew how to survive in that moment and in that time. Uh, you know, someone posted in the group that they didn't like the book and I wanted to hear what y'all didn't like about it, but everyone's this, you know? Okay, here is this, the, the Negro name was Albert Jacks. She put on her, she put a little green ribbon in her hair and her little ponytail. He was like, oh no, 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 can't do this anymore. And it was a problem and he had to let it, he, he dipped on out. And that's when she realized she didn't even know a nigga name. She was ready. to go. Hmm. All right, we're gonna wrap up this discussion. I don't know if anyone has any final thoughts. There's a certain, there's a small lag between when I ask a question and we'll start responding. But if you have any final thoughts, we can take these last 10 minutes or so and we can discuss them if there's anything in particular that you, I didn't address that you would like to address. But I think, personally, I read this book, Sula, oh, this is my first time reading it. I think I might have skimmed it like in middle school or something. Cause I don't remember ever reading it, but I also feel like reading this book in the book club with all you guys and all the commentary made it such that made it a lot easier made me feel a lot better because there were so many times i was like am i reading you know you reading these books they can make you insecure and you read them you're like wait i'm not getting it you want to stop because like wait i gotta reread this what did i miss and i really just enjoyed all the dialogue with everyone because it really made it so much more enjoyable of a read and it made it much more interesting
One thing the whole community agreed on was superstition. Ninjas could not get it together to support or build anything just negative. I mean, but you know, when you don't have access and options, it's like how do conspiracy theories you typically travel, right? Like how do like most superstitions and conspiracy theories come out of a place of like wanting to cling to some sort of hope in the most hopeless of situations. So it made sense to me that the community was still superstitious or still believed in like, you know, mystical things because so much in your reality <laughs> gives you no hope or joy. It's so bad, it's so bad. Hmm. Everybody had to re reread this book so many times because what, yes, what Toni Morrison, the way she wrote it, you just think you're missing things. But I think being in this group and seeing everyone, you know, say, yo, I read this scene, I was like, what the fuck? And we're all kind of having these moments. Made me feel a lot more confident about what I was reading. Rachel says, thinking about gentrification and how Blacks suffer in an environment with no support financially, mentally, housing, and financially, mentally, housing, et cetera, and then they just come after and build luxury places where we've experienced so much sorrow. You know, and I guess that is the message, the secondary motif of gentrification that's in the book, because she sets it up about the how it becomes a suburb and a desirable part of town for the whites after all this pain, sorrow, and trauma, and hopelessness has run through it and through the Black people there. Uh, yeah, that that does kind of add to the, I guess, maybe the depths of what they were experiencing negatively. What the hell was the, the gray ball Nell's consciousness? Yeah, and you know, at the end of the book, so, uh, Nell is again reflecting on what's happening. She's having her kind of final, like her actual moment of like what, of thinking, right? Because she becomes a gray ball because again, she goes into survival mode. She has to take care of her as every other black woman in the bottom of her children. And her means of survival because as a black woman, she cannot check out and become as thoughtless as Sula or as thoughtless as the black men in the community. There's no one to take care of her, so she's to take care of the kids. And so rather than taking the time to feel her feelings and process her emotions around seeing her best friend <laughs> having sex with her husband and her husband then immediately leaving and abandoning the family after that, like Sula nor Nell at, at the end get, gets the husband. Oh man, what was her husband's name? Why did I need to give everybody's name? Um, and you know, he takes up with Sula for like a brief period of time and even she discards of him. And it, it's hurtful because not even, I don't, I, it wasn't even so much the act of Sula sleeping with her husband, it's how she gets abandoned in the end and loses the little bit of, you know, silence that she was holding on to. And I think that gray ball was just her, her barreling down and surviving and not thinking about it and not feeling the feelings and not processing the emotions. And it comes becomes something so visual in our head that's like the elephant in the room. It wasn't my favorite book, but Toni Morrison is always a difficult read for me. I remember reading Beloved when I was younger, before I really could appreciate it from an artful and truly literary standpoint, and it messed me up for a couple of days. I don't know what to, I didn't know what to make of it. You know, my first Toni book was Song of Solomon, and I read it in English class in 10th grade. And I love that. To this day, I still love that book. But because I read it in the classroom, I don't I don't think independently I could have read that book and got it because there's a lot of mysticism. She does kind of keep up this very matter of fact, kind of punch you in the gut way of writing. Um, Jazz was actually a pretty easy read for me. And what else? I didn't like her um, God Help the Child. That wasn't a difficult read for me, but I didn't really care for it. Like, funny enough, I have never read Beloved because I have consistently heard that it is a complicated read. Ah, uh, yes, Nell's husband's name was Jude. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> Everyone's commenting now that her husband's name was Jude. To 
Tanisha saying her first Tony book was The Bluest Eyes, and I couldn't appreciate how I do now. You know, I think one, reading Tony with age, maturity, and reading it as a collective definitely makes the books more attainable and accessible. Oh, money. All right, we are going to wrap this up. As always, I just want to remind you guys, this book club is meant to be evergreen. So just because we're wrapping it up, you know, we're closing out this month with Sula and we're moving on to Eloquent Rage. And the person that helped me with my PhD application is her best friend. So very good chance that she will come in. Very good chance if I get her. Um, and then the complex theory read that we're doing next month by Patricia Hill Collins. Patricia, Dr. Collins already said she's going to come do a chat. So you know, we're, I'm excited because we'll start rolling out author chats. Unfortunately, more, Tony Morrison is no longer with us, so so sad. But um, what I did want to say is even though we are we are closing out, wrapping up, that you can always, if you're just finishing Sula, if you catching this five years later and you want to talk about Sula, by all means, post up in the group. You can always purchase the syllabus. It is always available. And we are always here to discuss what we have read. You can always come back and meet you where you are. It's all good. Um, Jordana is saying, have you read, have you caught the Toni Morrison documentary on Hulu? I was set the screener. So I watched that like four or five times before I even hit the movie theater. Then went to the movie theater and watched it again twice. What is it called? Pieces? It's now on Hulu? Um, I believe it's called Pieces. The Pieces I Am. I want to say Pieces of Me. But yes, it is The Pieces I Am, and it is wonderfully done. It is a really good documentary. I loved it. So many quotes to pull from it. It's really encouraging because Toni Morrison speaks specifically to how she does not write for a white gaze. Um, and maybe that's a little bit of what makes her books a little bit complicated. She's writing um, to her own community, the community that she comes from, for her own understanding, and she wants you to catch up. And she does kind of force us all to catch up to her. Uh, yeah, I love that documentary. And if you, if for anyone who's had a difficult time or maybe didn't enjoy this book as much or this book felt a little tricky for them, definitely go walk, watch the documentary. They talk specifically about Sula in the documentary. Um, it just gives new context and new understanding, and it's a really great document to watch. She's awesome. I, too, am very excited for all the March reads. It's my birth month, March 25th. We're not a Pisces. We're Aries, okay? Cash out with her on the 25th. But um, thank you all for joining. I am excited to break into the next reading. We have a really dope, again, grab the syllabus because it provides a lot of discussion. And if you're ever questioning things, Samantha did a really good job on breaking down this book in particular. And Morgan did a great job on breaking down Sula. I'm really proud of all the work Sula by Cohort is doing. And your support helps me to pay everyone a living wage. Is who coming out this way? Me. No, I had to cancel my trip to Italy because of the virus. So sad. I'm so mad. Canceled it today. Sorry. <laughs> All right, please read the newsletter, open it. I don't know, we had like a really, there was like over a thousand people signed up for the newsletter and maybe 600 people are reading it, which is not bad, but it's redesigned. I've been throwing so much money to make sure this book club experience is an enjoyable experience for everyone. So um, purchase the syllabus or set it to be an insider and help support what we're doing here. Thank y'all for joining. Deuces.